Welcome to On the Middle East, the podcast of the award-winning media service, El Monitor, where each week we talk with the decision makers and thought leaders who are making the news and shaping the trends in the Middle East. I'm Andrew Parasoliti, president of El Monitor, and today we're talking with El Monitor Gaza columnist, Hannah Sala. Hannah is a Palestinian journalist who focuses on financial, business, agricultural, and development issues. She has a master's degree in economic development from the Islamic University of Gaza. And in addition to her work for El Monitor, she has written for Palestinian newspapers, the LA Times, Al Jazeera, and Turkey's Anadolu News Agency. There are over 2 million people living in Gaza. Israel controls the border in the north. Egypt controls the border in the south. The territory is governed by the Islamic Resistance Movement, or Hamas, which won elections there in 2007. Conditions in Gaza have been described by the UN and international agencies as grim. Gaza's economy contracted by 11.5% last year. That's according to the World Bank. And the prospective recovery this year of 3.5% growth will depend on the success of the vaccination rollout and beating COVID-19. Poverty is at 30% and unemployment at about 50%, according to official numbers. And let me quote the World Bank here. More than a year into the COVID-19 pandemic, the crisis is unprecedented in an already faltering economy with job and income losses. We'll talk about all of this and more with Hannah Sala. That conversation begins now. Hannah, welcome to On the Middle East. Thank you. So much to discuss, but let's start with the news. Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas canceled elections last week. What has been the reaction from Gaza, both from the people there, and also Hamas's official reaction to Abbas's decision? Yes, uh, actually, the what is happening in Jerusalem now and canceling the, the elections because Jerusalem will not be part of this Palestinian elections is making uh, Palestinian factions and military factions actually in Gaza very angry. Uh, today, the shadowy leader, Mohammed al-Daif, has been hiding uh, for more than two decades uh, just issued uh, the first public statement uh, in uh, nearly seven years, and he was warning Israel that uh, it will pay a heavy price if it uh, evicts Palestinians from their homes in East Jerusalem. So, uh, um, so cancelling the elections uh, because Jerusalem will not be part of that, and the current tension between uh, people in Jerusalem and settlers there is making the situation in Gaza very hard because Palestinian factions has uh, factions uh, have started like uh, a small round of escalation last week. They were warning that if the situation did not calm in Jerusalem, they will uh, escalate more. They uh, have uh, fired more than uh, 40 uh, locally produced rockets uh, towards the settler uh, or settlements around the Gaza border. And uh, Israel uh, reacted uh, toward uh, this uh, action actually by uh, hitting the military uh, posts for, uh, for Hamas and Islamic Jihad in Gaza. So this makes the situation hard uh, for Gazans because it is um, uh, about one year and a half uh, since the corona outbreak. Uh, the situation was a little bit uh, calm compared to the previous years. So Israel has closed the sea for about three years, uh, three days last week, and this was hard for uh, fishermen who uh, depend on daily uh, life and depend on daily basis for their livelihood on fishing. So uh, it was hard for them to keep the uh, sea closed for a full three days in addition to the COVID-19 restrictions that uh, restrict marketing their uh, products and has uh, um, decreased uh, the income for them. So I think the situation in Gaza is like preparing for, for a coming uh, escalation. It is expected, actually, because uh, this warning uh, from uh, Mohammed Daif, the uh, military um, leader, and from the political leader, uh, Ismail Haniyeh, today, he said that 
uh, in preparation for the 10th of uh, May, there will be settlers who will um, demonstrate in Jerusalem. So the situation need more support to uh, Jerusalem and residents there from Palestinians and Arab world. So I think that they are preparing for something. Maybe there will be escalation if, if the situation in Jerusalem did not calm down in the coming days. The reason given by President Abbas was that uh, Israel would not allow Palestinians to participate in the elections in Jerusalem. But Palestinians, as, as I understand it, were, were still hopeful about the elections. Was there a hope about the elections among especially young people in Gaza? And while you describe the sentiment toward, toward Israel and the escalations that are currently happening around the issue in Jerusalem, do Palestinians blame President Abbas for this delay as well? Actually, uh, Palestinians in Gaza understand that uh, the elections uh, uh, was postponed, uh, but they don't know if, if it can happen in the future, actually. They are not saying it was cancelled, but they feel that it was uh, totally cancelled. This is the second elections in 16 years, uh, and um, the second election since the coming of the Palestinian Authority to uh, Palestinian territories in 1994, according to the uh, uh, signed Oslo Accord. Uh, Hamas and Palestinian factions are demanding uh, to uh, to do the elections in May as uh, expected, but I think that if the uh, elections um, will be really cancelled, this will lead for escalation because it's two two uh, choices that they have to go to elections and uh, to try to uh, do political solutions for the problems that the political system have internally and with Israel or to go with escalation because the problems will not be solved uh, if, uh, if the election will, will be cancelled. So is that a way of saying that the, um, the Palestinians, especially young Palestinians, don't blame President Abbas uh, for this? Do you think that an outcome will be uh, a unity or increased political unity between, you know, Fatah, uh, and Hamas and those who support them? Or do you see those relations getting a lot worse at the, after recent events? I think that uh, young people here in Gaza know or understand the situation very well. They are hopeless now because they think that um, Hamas and uh, other factions even Fatah are not doing solutions for Palestinians currently. They are doing that in a way that uh, their movement want to benefit uh, from being in authority. And this is not democracy actually. And they, they um, understand that uh, the democracy means that they have to solve the issues of all, all the citizens who participate in electing this movement or that movement. But I think that youth here in Gaza understand that uh, these factions and these movements are uh, participating in the elections to take their own shares of the cake. They want to make sure that uh, each of uh, their leaders or uh, members who, who voted for them are given authority after the end of the elections. But for normal people, for poor people, they don't see impact. Uh, and they know that Hamas was uh, trying to uh, make some improvements um, on the on the situation in Gaza, but this was impossible because um, Hamas uh, started its rule in Gaza without international or Palestinian support. So it was hard to solve the economic situation. It depends on aid, and some poor people here in Gaza are happy with receiving this aid, but they understand that this is not permanent and they uh, depend on monthly support that is given from Arab uh, countries that may be cut for political reasons. So this is not a long-term uh, solution that the youth are uh, longing for. And I think that most of people here in Gaza, not only the youth, but even the old people who are working independently uh, without being member of any faction uh, has uh, uh, lost hope uh, in having solution uh, using the election. But when, uh, like last month and uh, the previous months, they were uh, having this hope of, okay, this will be a solution 
and they were dreaming that the solutions will will come uh, if they uh, if the if the election uh, started. But I think that when um, Mr. President Mahmoud Abbas uh, took his speech before a few days, I think that the people like just like uh, wake up from that dream. And they understood again that uh, this will not be um, uh, the solution for uh, for the problems that is currently happening. Hannah, in your conversations with young people, and you describe most of the youth there as uh, hopeless about the political situation, although there may have been some hope, as you described, also about the elections. But those who are politically interested, politically active, are they more likely to be supportive of Hamas? Uh, in these Islamic-oriented groups, or to support Fatah, President Abbas's party, or maybe uh, Mohammed Dahlan's party, or what we might otherwise say are secular political parties. What is the direction and thinking among the youth who you're talking to at the university and, and elsewhere? Yes, actually, uh, when I talk to normal people here in Gaza, even youth or old people, I think that those people who are not benefiting from these factions and like having support from them, logistical or financial support, they are not supporting these uh, these factions. They are supporting having a freedom and having a, a good uh, life. So most of people here in Gaza are looking for a better life. Sometimes you will see that they are very hard supporting the uh, resistance. Not because they like war or because they they want war, but when they see that uh, uh, the Israeli restrictions are increasing and the Palestinian military factions are responding uh, and reacting, so they will feel that they are more saved by these actions. And uh, that's why you will see that a majority of those youth will support the uh, military factions because they are the only actor on the ground that plays a good role in protecting the rights of Palestinians, um, regardless what is the tool that they are uh, using. Uh, for supporting the movements, I think that if, if a political uh, um, situation was more stable here in Gaza and the elections uh, was uh, um, conducted uh, as a plan, I think that uh, you will find uh, more people who are supporting many factions uh, because there is a differentiation and there is a, a, di a diversification even in the uh, ideas of, of youth here in Gaza. You will not only find people who are supporting uh, Hamas or Islamic groups, you will find secular people who are supporting uh, the um, democracy as, as a tool to solve uh, the uh, problems in the country. So uh, and they are hoping for to uh, for a two states uh, solution. So I think that people here in Gaza are different, and they they are like other countries. They are not one group, uh, and they don't have one uh, way of of thinking. So they are different, and this depends on the situation on the ground that plays um, a great um, contribution in how uh, the situa this situation um, reflect uh, the future of, this, of those people. Shift to life in, in, in Gaza. I began the podcast with some numbers about the extent of, of poverty and unemployment. How are people getting by? And give us your assessment of, of the economy in terms of what you see every day in terms of your reporting there. Yes, actually, the unemployment uh, in the last qu quarter of 2020 was uh, uh, 49 percent uh, from the Gaza uh, uh, work uh, uh, force. Uh, I think that the uh, COVID-19 played uh, a role in uh, increasing the uh, unemployment in Gaza because most of people here de depends uh, uh, on the daily wage work when they work in uh, daily uh, work on a restaurant or in a wedding hall or even institutions. Uh, it is hard to find uh, people who are working in permanent uh, jobs here in Gaza and getting a good salary, unless they are working for the Palestinian Authority or for Hamas. And most of Hamas uh, employees uh, also suffer from having part of their uh, monthly income, sometimes 60% of their income, 
So this was reflected on the situation. The market uh, depend mainly on the income that is coming from the salaries of Hamas employee, Palestinian Authority employee, and those uh, laborers who are working in the daily wage uh, work. So the situation is getting hard for people. It is, I don't think that the, the unemployment will decrease unless there are um, a, a vision uh, of uh, projects that uh, support the economic situation here in Gaza. Uh, without the projects from the government or from international NGOs, I don't think that people here will be able to create uh, um, and new ways to find the uh, livelihoods. They are trying to cope with the situation by finding these daily wage uh, work, but this is not sufficient for them to uh, cover all their monthly needs, especially if they have uh, um, uh, children and they are responsible about good education uh, for them and the good food and the uh, good conditions that they have to support uh, th those children in their family. So I think that situation is hard and uh, actually. Um, in other countries, uh, people maybe in uh, you can say in Gulf countries, for example, they are giving the uh, zakat um, annually by 30.5 percent from their financial savings. But in Gaza, those employees are considered part of those people who should receive the zakat. So the government is giving zakat for its employees because those employees are considered poor. Uh, today, I just saw uh, a statement from the government said that uh, Hamas, I mean the de facto government in Gaza, Hamas employees who uh, receive $500 and less will be receiving as a cat. This means that they are considered poor in the Islamic Sharia and they deserve to uh, receive financial support from rich people. I think that this makes situation hard. If even if they are employed, their economic situation is not good, and they are not able to uh, give zakat, but they are receiving zakat. This is one indicator that I can say about how hard uh, the situation in Gaza, even for those employed people. And is work still available in Israel? Actually, Israel is restricting movement. Some uh, people or labor uh, tried to go to work in Israel. You know, since the um, the uh, 2000, the, the second uprising, Israel started to restrict the movement of labor from Gaza to Israel. But there, there uh, was like a number of people who were going from Gaza to work uh, inside Israel and they were getting a good salaries. However, in uh, 2007, when Hamas uh, took the rule in Gaza, it was totally banned for labor to go from Gaza to uh, Israel. Actually, some of them are going like um, a merchant. He do uh, some papers uh, here locally that he is a merchant and he want to go to get some uh, material or inputs that he want to import to Gaza. But when he goes there with a merchant permit, which is a VIP permit, he start to work as a labor with maybe 300 or 200 dollar per day and some of them don't come back but since march last year the restrictions on uh, areas has increased uh, because um, of the covid-19 situation it was like um, more precautionary measures to avoid the, the uh, outbreak in west bank and israel let's talk a little about covid-19 you've written about the toll that COVID is taking in Gaza. Tell us about how the government and, and people are coping with the pandemic and are vaccinations available? I cited in the opening one of the reports, recent reports, I think it's the World Bank, which noted that any turnaround in the Gaza economy that's about to come will depend on the success of the vaccination campaign in Gaza as it is in other parts of the world. Yes, actually, uh, in February, it was hard to import the vaccination uh, because Israel was banning this. After advocacy from many international NGOs and uh, actors, Israel allowed the injury of about uh, 1,000 uh, of this uh, vaccine. Now, the Palestinian or the de facto government led by Hamas uh, uh, has received 40,000 uh, of uh, vaccine, um, or uh, not 40,000, actually. It was 
40,000 persons who can be vaccinated by this received uh, vaccine from uh, COVAX. Um, um, and from this is like initiative from the UN, from Hamad Dahlan, and uh, the Fatih rival from the United Arab Emirates and from the Palestinian Authority Minister of Health in West Bank. So these were three sources to uh, receive the vaccine, but this is still a limited amount of vaccine that is not enough uh, for the resident in Gaza. At the beginning, people were not uh, encouraged enough to get the vaccine. But when the, um, the number of infected people uh, has increased, they started to go to um, the governmental um, institutions uh, to get the to get uh, the vaccine. But currently, I think that there there is shortage and a clear shortage uh, uh, of the vaccine because after the increase of the uh, infected cases, Hamas uh, started to impose uh, some precautionary measures to um, prevent more infection and more. Uh, pressure on its health system in the hospitals. So um, people try to go to take vaccine, but I think that currently there is a deficit of this vaccine. There is not uh, no clear way of, uh, of uh, having a new uh, vaccine to the Gazans, but the, this is um, a challenge for Gazans actually, because there is no uh, ability to go outside and to take the vaccine. They cannot receive the vaccine from Israel or other other um, country or any other aid, uh, and they cannot buy the vaccine. So people here in Gaza are like stuck because of the Israeli siege and because of the health system that is not enough to support uh, the critical cases who are um, infected by COVID-19. Uh, there are over 2 million Palestinians in Gaza, close to 3 million in the West Bank, which is about 60 miles away. And as we've been talking about, Gaza, Gaza is governed by Hamas, the West Bank by the authority led by Fatah. How connected do residents of Gaza feel to those in the West Bank? Uh, am I correct that travel is difficult, if not impossible, for Palestinians in Gaza to visit in, in the West Bank? People in, in Gaza feel that they are too much connected to, to West Bank and to Jerusalem. They are following the news, what is happening there, and they are sometimes reacting. Because last week, uh, a normal uh, demonstrations from normal people and youth uh, went into Gaza streets to support Jerusalem. Uh, they uh, went uh, to the streets regardless of the lockdown that uh, was imposed by Hamas here. Um, it is Ramadan, and after 6 p.m., the sunset, and the breakfast time, Hamas has imposed like a full lockdown. They cannot go to the streets. But after breaking fast, uh, many youth went to the streets to support Palestinians in Jerusalem and to support the conflict that is going there because many Jerusalem uh, residents are um, in a battle with uh, Israeli settlers regarding the ownership of their, uh, of their homes there. So they think that um, the Israeli uh, system is not uh, giving them their rights, and they here are uh, feeling angry, and they are asking for actually military support for uh, what is happening in Jerusalem. Uh, some of them were like asking for Hamas uh, reaction on what is happening in Jerusalem. Other people are supporting on social media. They are like boasting um, uh, the events and uh, what is happening in Jerusalem, and they are supporting by words um, um, what is happening there. So they are feel more connected to to Jerusalem. And many people, if you just ask here the Palestinians in Gaza, they were they will tell you that how much they long to go to West Bank and to Jerusalem. Since many years, since uh, 2000, the second uprising, limited number of people uh, were allowed to go uh, and uh, cross areas to West Bank, to Jerusalem, and to other uh, Palestinian areas. So I think that uh, the situation is hard for, for Gazans because uh, since the Israeli blockade in 2007, um, leaving Gaza is hard, not only to Israel, to West Bank and Jerusalem, but to any other world, uh, world uh, parts. Because if they want to go for education, they want to go for marriage, they want to go for 
um, even Hajj, they cannot go outside Gaza easily. So this makes them um, feel more connected to the outside world, not only West Bank. They want and they are dreaming of having this freedom of movement. And how have the Abraham Accords affected the view of Palestinians in Gaza? And if you could comment on how the people there feel about you know, Arab countries who are involved and in influential in political life, you know, Egypt, Qatar, the UAE, Saudi Arabia. Uh, people in Gaza feel that they are more angry for what is happening in uh, United Arab Emirates. They usually were supported by uh, Arab countries and they don't see it easy uh, for um, uh, people from uh, Gulf countries go to uh, Israel, uh, visit their malls and uh, being in their streets and making uh, like um, a peaceful treatment with them while they are still striking Gaza and they are restricting people in Gaza for uh, nothing because just because they are resisting uh, the occupation and then they don't want this uh, occupational uh, restrictions. What about the other countries that have been involved? Uh, Egypt, Qatar continues to play a, a key role and Gaza, Saudi Arabia. How, how are those countries p- perceived? Um, Gazans know um, and feel that they are uh, given support by normal people from Egypt and other countries. They know that this um, agreement or peace uh, agreement with uh, Israel was agreement of regimes or systems there. So they still have hope that this this situation will uh, change in the future. And they think that this was like uh, something not normal and they did not use uh, to see normal Um, relations with Israelis um, while the Palestinian people are suffering. Usually, uh, the Palestinian cause was the heart of uh, of the Arab uh, discussions in their conference, in their normal life, and they did not feel that it was easy to see uh, normal uh, relations with Israel from Arab countries, even Egypt, even Saudi Arabia and Arab Emirates. What is the perception of Iran? Iran has uh, supported Hamas. Uh, it also supports Islamic Jihad, which, like Hamas, is uh, designated as a terrorist group by Israel and the U.S. Um, what is the perception of Iran, and how do you see its its role in Gaza? Normal people in Gaza understand that Iran is supporting Hamas and supporting uh, Islamic Jihad. Uh, Some people are objecting this because they think that this is a proxy war and uh, Iran is not supporting uh, them for free. So uh, you will find those two uh, directions of uh, of support uh, from people. Those who are supporting the Palestinian factions and consider that they are free to get get the support from Iran, but they should not uh, be a part of the proxy war that uh, Iran is leading while other people are praising Iran and they are um, um, think that uh, Iran is like, uh, uh, although that it, it is a Shia, they consider that this is an Islamic state that is supporting the Palestinians, so it should be supported as well. And they are not considering this as a proxy war. They see that this is um, uh, a good uh, support and uh, welcome support from Iran. What is the perception of U.S. policy and the Biden administration? And what are the expectations and hopes, if any, that uh, people in Gaza may have for U.S. policy in the region? Many people here in Gaza were suffering because of the uh, Donald Trump uh, cut for uh, the UNRWA aid. Uh, and uh, many UNRWA employees were affected as well here in Gaza. So the, um, the people were having this hope that uh, this change will make uh, this fund will come back. So this will make uh, some economic relief for the sectors here in uh, Palestinian territories. And they were happy with uh, receiving uh, the news of um, um, having a, a decision to um, give the fund again to uh, the U.S. agency, the U.S. aid to support Palestinians again, though they know uh, and and understand the complication of the work of this agency because they have uh, um, been monitored and they they should not support any uh, any people who are related to uh, Hamas 
and they are considering uh, those even poor people who are related to Hamas as terrorists. So it is difficult uh, to get the support of this uh, agency, but they were happy that uh, this agency will work again. And uh, even the honor work as main source of the food voucher for, for Palestinians in Gaza. This food voucher was the main source of income for many people here in Gaza. The poor families were depending on the quarterly food packages that they were receiving from UNRWA. And if this was um, not received, this would be a problem on food uh, security for these families. So I think that uh, people were happy and they are waiting for a change from uh, Biden uh, administration. They have more hope than they have previously. Thank you for a great conversation today. I appreciate your taking the time. And thank you for your reporting for El Monitor from Gaza. We learned a great deal from your articles. Thank you. And I hope that I have contributed with something good. We wish you and all friends in Gaza a peaceful last week of Ramadan. Thank you so much. Inshallah, we hope. <laughs> we will return after this short break. I'm Ben Kaspit, Al Monitor veteran columnist reporting from Israel, one of the world's major news and action suppliers of all times, comparing to its tiny size. I've been covering and analyzing the political, diplomatic, and military arenas in Israel for over 34 years. My best selling biography, The Netanyahu Years, was out two years ago. I covered seven prime ministers, one major war, two intifadas, one prime minister's assassination two and a half peace treaties, four military operations in Gaza, and it's not letting up anytime soon. I am glad to invite you to On Israel, our brand new podcast, where we will discuss major events in Israel and its surroundings, talk to decision makers, leaders and analysts, and try to understand the chaos that comes with the territory of Israel and the Middle East. You will never have a dull moment with us. See you soon here. On Israel, Al Monitor. Thanks again to our guest, Hannah Sawa, for joining us today from Gaza, and to our production team of Phil Calabro of El Monitor and Beowulf Rashlin of Two Square Media Productions. And thanks to all of you for listening. We will return next week, and in the meantime, Please sign up for this and our other El Monitor podcast on Israel at your favorite podcast platform. Mm-hmm.